Okay, so uh, what I did was actually something that is uh, more related to um, to rendering workflow in terms of um, uh, image production. Uh, not not exactly some tweaking of, of settings and, and parameters, but just something that is more related with uh, producing images in a, well, I wouldn't say a batch because there are some utilities for that, but um, uh, something that will ease eventually the way that we, we, can, sh we can shift from one V-Ray setup to another V-Ray setup. Um, you might notice that here at the bottom you have the open and save icons. Uh, you can then open, you have eventually save and then reopen uh, specific V-Ray uh, rendering settings. Um, so what I did actually was simply this. I first created another view, another named views in, in, in Rhino. So you might see that in my uh, named views there is another camera which is saved, which is called closed up, close up. Um, because I, with respect to the scene that, uh, that uh, you also have in your computer, you notice that there was this cup here. Uh, actually, it was on this side. I placed it here in the opposite corner of, my, of, of this desk. And I placed a camera right looking at it in a close-up view. So if I go in, into this perspective view and double-click on close-up, this is what I get. Okay? Uh, because I wanted to create also a, a different scene, a different uh, rendering of this uh, of this uh, scene. Okay, um, so it's nothing. Uh, let's say it's nothing complex. It's something that you just have to um, take the uh, perspective viewport, hit F6 on keyboard. You have the camera here in your um, three orthogonal views, and then you place the camera uh, in the right position. Right. So this is this is the only thing that you must do. And once you have the uh, the camera uh, in the correct position, then you just save the uh, the named view and you have it available forever. Um, but the thing is that I wanted to, and this, this is real life because I do it basically uh, quite daily, um, I wanted to create an image which is uh, suitable, for example, in, in social, social media publications like, for example, on Instagram and so on. So I needed a square, um, uh, aspect ratio. And then I went here on render output and I changed from match viewport to square. Okay. Um, and in square, I had to increase the resolution. So I changed this value. Now, all these settings that I eventually would do in real life, like this one, are changing uh, at the actual setup of V ray asset editor. Okay. So let's say that I already made this render. Okay. And I want to switch back to the previous rendering, which was the interior 01. Okay. Now, if I switch back to interior 01, I still have the square aspect ratio in the render output. So one thing that you can do is, for example, take this rendering setup here with the square aspect ratio and the desired resolution and save it. Okay. So that's what I did, actually. So when I want to move back to my interior 01, um, aspect ratio, which is a rectangle. I simply go here. I save, of course, the settings. I simply go here and I can open the settings that I have saved. So here is the Instagram uh, 1080 by 1080 and here is the viewport. So I double click this and automatically the ray loads all the settings of uh, the rendering engine and so on, but especially these render output settings. Okay, so I didn't change anything, of course, in the render settings because I wanted to work with the same light settings and so on. But I have this, um, uh, this different um, uh, aspect ratio and resolution for the final image. Okay? And one other thing that I did, which is something that we didn't um, uh, look at yesterday, is this thing. If I go into a close-up, which makes more sense because normally this effect is something that you would activate when you have some uh, need for um, isolating or, or giving more visibility to objects that are on in, uh, in a close-up rather than on the background. So we are talking about famous depth of field, right? So if I have this configuration here, and not, not eventually this one, because in this case, for example, depth of field is basically useless because all the interesting objects uh, lie on the same plane or, or are basically at the same distance from the viewpoint. So, I, so, so in this case, there, there is basically no absolute need of, of depth, depth of field, unless you want to 
um, let's say, um, give more importance to this part of the image with respect to the other room, but it's a, it's a very small detail. So if I go here, I want to have this object here in focus and the other things here blurred by depth of field. So how do we do this? Well, it's very, very easy. This is something that uh, actually uh, I cherish this, this uh, simplification that was made with the um, uh, latest version of V-Ray, uh, because you will notice that in V-Ray toolbar, there is a specific button for this, which is this one that sets camera focus. Okay, so you can simply click in the, in the right point where you want the, the focus to be perfect. Everything will be blurred, um, both closer, uh, closer than that point and farther than that point. Okay, so how do we activate this? Well, this is a property of, of the camera. So the camera has a depth of field, which I already activated. Okay, so if I, for example, uh, execute a V-Ray interactive render right now, despite the fact that I didn't load the uh, Instagram aspect ratio or the square aspect ratio, you see, you will notice that this part of the cup is perfectly uh, visible. There is no blurring occurring here, but the rest of the scene, you see that is not getting the right definition because of uh, the, the depth of field. And uh, once you click with uh, the uh, set camera focus on the right spot, I click uh, on this handle here. Uh, once you do this and you activate the depth of field, here you decide how much defocus you want. Now, this is not exactly um, like correct in terms of uh, photography techniques. Yeah, it, it depends on many things. Um, actually, there are, there are other parameters that allow tweaking the uh, depth of field. Uh, if uh, you go here on the right, uh, there are some advanced settings. For example, if you go into advanced settings, uh, there are many advanced settings. Um, here, for example, you can uh, activate the bokeh effect that is related with the, with the depth of field, of course. And then you have access to how many blades does the, your shutter, shutter uh, have in your camera and, uh, and many other aspects of bokeh effect. But uh, we are not going to discuss this in very, uh, let's say, specific details. Uh, normally, a simple depth of, uh, depth of field is more than, than enough. And you are just to tweak this value here. So if you want more to focus on your in, in your image, then you simply switch this to a higher value, and you see that it immediate, immediately reacts to your to your settings. Now, the focus and depth of field uh, are are um, absolutely necessary if you are um, producing some kind of uh, product rendering or interior scene rendering. There is always the need of a of a depth of field effect always. You cannot avoid it. So it's very easy to set up. You just decide what's the um, focus distance. So for example, dynamically, if I take this um, function here and click on, I have a vase here, and I'm setting the focus on the top edge of this, uh, of this vase. And you now see that V-Ray um, automatically shifts the uh, focus to, to that point and the cup is totally blurred. Totally because my uh, defocus is set to a very high value. So if I reduce this, I will have a nice blurring of this object because it's uh, in a very close up position and uh, there will be this kind of nice smooth transition from uh, a defocus situation to a perfectly visible and sharp uh, visualization here. Okay, so it's very easy to set up. You just click the point where you want the focus uh, to be at, and then you set up the depth of field and the focus in your camera setting. Okay, and once you are skilled enough or you want to go deeper in this uh, topic, then you go into advanced camera parameters where you can find everything that's related with the camera, and you will find also the bokeh effect, uh, which is a very particular uh, phenomenon that occurs when you have lights in your um, in your scene. But anyway, we are not going to discuss this. Um, and so what I need to do here is eventually, uh, if I want to, uh, the problem that I have in, in this scene and then I, that I want to solve right now with you is that, um, is that if I go back 
uh, this was 0.5, right? And uh, my focus was on this uh, handle. Okay? If I go back to the uh, interior 01 lot, okay? Oh, actually, I think this was a little less because I see too much default disappearing. Yeah, okay, it was like this, 0 0.3. So if I go back to interior 01 lot, um, let's wait for it to react. Yeah, here it is. I have defocus right now, right? Because when I saved the uh, actual render settings, I forgot to deactivate the depth of field. Okay, so you see that I have the, I have this preset for as you have the viewport, but when I load, uh, when I load the um, the viewport, I still have the focus, and I don't want the focus on this uh, in this viewport because I told you that there is no need in this case, no specific need. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the interactive rendering, and I'm going here where I have a render output is set to match viewport correctly for this uh, scene, and I want to deactivate the focus in this case. I don't need it, and then I would resave this as viewport V-Ray rendering settings. I want to substitute the file, of course, overwrite it, and now everything is uh, perfectly uh, set up. So when you want to switch from a scene with its own settings to another scene with its own settings, you just change the viewport and reload, sorry, reload the proper settings, like in this case, you see that the um, save screen adapts and you know that you have loaded the right uh, setup here okay so it's just tweaking some parameter and then saving the, the uh, actual settings and uh, connect uh, these settings to the right saved uh, or named view okay like this let me go back to this because we are going to work with uh, our default scene okay um, another thing that i wanted to to tell you about uh, yesterday last topic uh, remember that we uh, introduced the HDRI images um, like environment setup in terms both of background and illumination and, and lighting of, uh, of our model. And I told you that the, the best way of working with uh, this kind of technique is using three different dome light, each one affecting one specific uh, aspect of the rendering uh, or of uh, the interaction between the light and the model. So there is one affecting only diffusion, so how objects are basically interacting with light. Um, one is affecting specularity, and one is affecting reflection. Okay? Now, um, this is actually the, the standard setup when you want to produce final rendering or, or production rendering. Okay? But while you are setting things up, eventually uh, the, you are more focused on uh, determining the right direction for the light sources and so on. So in that case, uh, I wouldn't recommend to do this at the start. This is just a final setup where you can tweak the different contribution for all these lights with relation to the uh, specific effects that you get over your object with their diffuse color, reflection properties and so on. So normally what I would do would be to use just one light at the beginning. Uh, you take this light and you make it interact with all the aspects of, of your materials, like fuse spectra and reflection. And uh, this is, this is uh, um, the first step where you want to, for example, uh, I wanted to determine the right uh, uh, direction for the sunlight inside this room. Okay? Now, if I have three lights, I have to move them and rotate them and operate on them in a um, well synchronized way, right? So I have three objects instead of one, but I prefer to tweak their contribution, their separate contribution, only when I know exactly what is the final direction that I need for that light. And another thing that uh, that I wanted to tell you is that when you uh, have this dome light here, for example, uh, you notice that. Uh, I already gave some rotation to this object. When you insert a dome light, normally the default is that this arrow here is coming from the right. Okay, so it's horizontally coming from the right. So there is already some, some rotation. And I can also, due to the fact that I have some control point here, I can also determine exactly what's the rotation of this, uh, of this object right now. So I can measure this, uh, this angle 
like this, and it's 12.81, okay? So why am I measuring this? Because if I go into V-Ray settings and I have the dome light, um, remember that the dome light is also an, an environment texture, right? So, um, uh, so basically I can do two things. Yesterday we were uh, immediately rotating the object and this was changing the rotation of, of the sun in our scene, right? But this rotation happens in Rhino. Uh, as regards V-Ray, the orientation of the HDRI image inside this uh, lamp here is still the same as the moment we inserted this light in, uh, as, as the moment we inserted this light in the scene. So for V-Ray, the sunlight is still coming from its original direction, okay? Because V-Ray doesn't know about this rotation. This rotation happened in, uh, in, in Rhino, okay? So if we go, for example, uh, here in the environment texture, uh, the environment texture has this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, sorry, let's go back to our uh, dome light. Um, the, um, the image that is connected to, to, this, um, uh, to this light here, which is the HDR image, um, can be rotated inside the ray as we saw yesterday with the rotation horizontal. Remember that there was also a rotation vertical, but it, it has no meaning um, for, for us in this situation. But you can rotate the image inside the ray why is this better? Because if you rotate it inside V-Ray um, window, you can also save that information together with the rendering settings file. So in that case, for example, if you, by any chance, you want to switch from a name view to another one, you will also be able to change the orientation of the HDRI image inside your light because it is saved inside V-Ray settings and it's not rotated in mind. okay? So it's just, um, it, it's just like um, details in terms of, of workflow, but uh, they can speed up your, your uh, image production process, okay? Uh, so remember that you can always save the settings, but you can only save settings that are, uh, or changes that are made inside the Ray interface, not Rhino interface, okay? So this rotation will not be taken into account by, by the Ray. And so I made this rotation in order to have my light coming from uh, basically a little more from the north. So I have lights here coming like this way, entering this way uh, inside the room. And so this gives some particular uh, light setup that hits, partly hits the uh, cup here that I placed in this corner of, of the desk. Uh, this is something that has to do with uh, uh, composition of, of uh, the image. And I did this because I wanted this close-up to have uh, uh, the cup partially illuminated in this area and in shadow here. So to give more uh, contrast and more dynamics to, to this image, okay? Um, so that's why I uh, prefer to have uh, this, uh, this rotation. Um, Okay, so this is what I wanted to, to point out uh, in order to close uh, yesterday's session. And now, um, today what we are going to do, we are going to start talking about uh, materials. Okay, we are going to start with the um, easiest material. Uh, so I would say um, uh, we will start, for, for example, um, from procedural materials, like very simple procedural materials, even if uh, um, um, well, and are, they are considered to be the complex materials, but as I told you yesterday, in my opinion, um, uh, working with texture is uh, absolutely more complex than working with procedural materials. Uh, we will discuss this later. I don't know if later today or starting uh, tomorrow, but anyway, uh, we will focus on, on procedural materials. Now, what is the meaning of procedural material? Because it, it, it sounds so... Uh, sci-fi, but in the end, it's a very stupid thing. So procedural material means that all the aspects of that material are defined procedurally. It means via algorithms inside the Ray interface. So there is no need of uh, external files to define the procedural material properties. Okay. So procedural means that it is uh, totally built inside the Ray um, interface 
by adding some uh, algorithms that generate all the aspects of that machine. Okay? Now, remember one thing. Uh, we are working with a default scene where in the V-Ray settings, we activated the material override. Now, this material override, we must turn it off if we want to see the real uh, um, behavior of light inside this scene and also the real, the actual material of, of all these objects, okay? But also remember that this material override is part of the render settings, so it was saved together with the uh, aspect ratio and resolution of uh, the um, camera, okay? So uh, one thing that happens normally, many, many times uh, I, I saw this uh, question, um, I try to render, but I don't see material. That, that's the reason why. 99% of the time is this switch here. So let's see what happens if I turn this switch off. Because until now, everything looks so perfect, right? So light balance and camera settings and everything looks perfect, okay? But if I switch this off and I, for example, try to render this scene with V-Ray Interactive in order to don't waste time with the production rendering, well, actually, I, I expected something worse uh, because normally what happens when you uh, stop overriding the material, what happens is that object go back to their default material. And let's take a look at what's the default material for this object because all of these objects here, they all share the same material, at least in our uh, scene. If you go into object properties and switch to material button here, you will see that they are all using layer material. Now, all these objects here belong to the default layer. There is no layer differentiation in my, in my scene, okay? So if I go into the layer tab, I see that they all belong to the default and the material of the default layer is an RGB 250, 250, 250. So it's, it's not pure white, but it's an extremely light gray, okay? So if I click here, you see that this material is part of the plaster family uh, now, these materials here are from the Cycles rendering engine, okay? So it's not V-Ray plaster. This is Cycles plaster family. And it means that they are basically uh, non-reflective material, more or less. They are whitish materials, and they are uh, meant to be used for plaster, um, uh, let's say, simulation, okay? But basically, they are white, okay? They have no other... Uh, property than uh, being white. So they are, um, hypothetically speaking, they are brighter than the actual override color, which was uh, this tone of gray. So normally what happens is that if you override material and set up all the properties of your lights, camera, and, uh, and uh, also the detail, film sensitivity, and shutter speed of your camera, when you switch back to the real uh, material, the scene tends to be brighter than the previous version. And normally what happens is that users tend to, oh, okay, so I go back to advanced camera parameters, and then I tweak the camera settings, and then, oh, I have too much light, so let's go into the environment, and eventually take the, uh, dome light and change its intensity and lower its intensity. No, don't do that, okay? Because you have set up all these settings considering a mid gray or a light gray, which is the average of your scene when you will have real materials. So not everything in your scene will be white, okay? So don't, uh, don't rely on your eyes when you switch back to real material because you are going to tweak all the materials. And the scene will go back to an average brightness, which is this one, or darker. Remember that this brightness here is set up according to what you expect to have as the main uh, colors in your scene. So remember that if our walls are dark blue, when you override material to perform the light studio, you should override color with a darker, a darker gray, okay? So when you go back to deactivate this, you will have a totally bright scene but you still have to set up the wall with a dark blue color, okay? So that's the point. Don't tweak the camera settings and environment and, and light settings once you switch back to uh, real materials, okay? And so let's start with the materials. Now, remember that we have uh, uh, some objects which are hidden in this scene, which are the glass panels of our window. So if I unhide 
everything. Now I have all these uh, little boxes here at the center of every frame of the windows, but this one. This one I left it initially because uh, I wanted to have at least one window letting light uh, get inside this room. This is the first rendering that we made, remember. So um, this has no panels. But it's very easy for us now, now that we know what we are going to do. I'm going to uh, invert and uh, lock this scene. Um, so, so you see that I cannot select uh, anything but the glass panel. And now I'm going to take this and group them because they are grouped and take just one group of, uh, well, they, they are still grouped. I, I think I grouped them several times. This was my mistake. So um, I take just one group of panels and then I copy them from this point, for example, to this point. And now I have this uh, uh, fully, um, uh, let's say, uh, glass enriched windows in my, in my scene. Okay? I'm going to ungroup a couple of times and then I'm going to group just once. So this has become one single group of, uh, of glass object or uh, the supposed to be glass object. Okay, so um, now that I have them like this, normally I tend to, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't use uh, very much um, uh, the object properties and layer differentiation in my, in my uh, models, uh, but uh, in order to have a clearer um, view or clearer representation of this, I'm going to change display color to cyan, for example, so we can easily distinguish if the glass are, is present or not in our scene. Okay, um, so let's go back to name views. Let's go back to uh, interior zero one. And uh, here we are, okay. Um, where is glass in our scene? So starting with glass, we need to also identify other glass objects. And the glass objects are also glass of these frames here. Uh, these frames, I modeled these uh, things a um, few years ago. Um, it might look like a standard frame, but it's a very high detail uh, object. So if I go here and, and take a closer look, you see that there are also small nails on the back that are needed to keep all the frame parts together. So it's a very high detail object. And also you might recognize that there is some uh, fillets and chamfers and so on. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite a high resolution object. And if you take a look at this from, from the top, you would see that all the parts are properly set up. And there is also um, the object for the picture. So you see that there are many things here. Let me uh, isolate. OK, so let's isolate the, the glass object. You should see the glass object or the, um, the two objects uh, that are the surface, which is the painting, and the polysurface is the glass. Okay, so it's they are very close together. If you want, you can go into the inner part of, of this object and uh, um, negative select these two things here. You see that it says they are various because it is a surface and the glass, and you will see that uh, you have selected these things here. So this polysurface is the glass with its thickness, and this thing is the painting, okay? So I need this, and I also need the other object that lie here, which is the polysurface, okay? So these two objects here, I also want to be uh, cyan. And this is it's not because I need them to be cyan in my model. This is just display color, it's not material. So the array doesn't care about this information. But if I want to select the glass the next time, I can select just one element and then select by color all the elements that have the same color. And this includes also the glass from my frames, as you can see, okay? Um, there is also another glass object, which is this. So I also need to display color cyan this. So Everything that's glass right now is, uh, is cyan, so I can easily select all the glass in my, in my scene, okay? So let's go back to our uh, default interior view. And so now if I um, V-Ray interactive this, 
Uh, there is no uh, interior light in my scene. So the only thing, the only light is the V-ray dome light that it's uh, on the outside. And as glass is not transparent right now, then there is no light inside my, my room. Okay, so this is why my scene is, has become black. So let's take the uh, cyan object. Let's go in V-ray and let's start creating our material. Now, if you don't have any material set up in V-ray, you will see that this is the, the material uh, interface. Uh, you will see that you don't switch to the interface if you don't have any material, but V-ray asks directly, okay, what kind of material do we want to create? Okay. Now, there are several uh, presets. Now, they are not exactly presets. Uh, the presets are uh, those that come from libraries. Okay. So if you go into, uh, if you open the, the uh, library tab, which is here on the left, and you switch from uh, create, which, where, where you can create any type of uh, object, okay, from uh, textures to whatever you want, uh, you switch to materials, and then you can create materials. Okay? And there are some presets, as you can see, which allow to create, uh, to use all presets material. Okay? Now, um, the easy approach to V-Ray is to go here, for example, look for glass, and you have many types of glass, but I wanted to understand how to create a, a material. And the best way to understand this is going into the material tab and create a generic material. Um, these things here are not exactly presets. I was, I was telling you, these are called shaders. Now, a shader is not a material. A shader is a complex setup of properties that um, define the, gen the general behavior of uh, a specific material. So when you select, for example, I don't know, uh, car paint. Car paint is not a specific car paint. It's the setup of properties of that material that allow a car paint behavior. And once you have the basic material, then you can tweak parameters and have the right uh, aspect for your car paint, okay? Um, one material that has become quite a standard uh, actually, and in, in several uh, rendering engine, is the, the so-called PBR. Um, PBR stands for basically a physically correct material. So if you select PBR and go here on the right, you have already set up a set of, um, of properties um, that define this a physically correct material. Normally, it is a mix of um, uh, diffusion, so diffuse color, reflection and how much uh, roughness and how much metallic effect you have on uh, on that uh, material and that's it okay um, it's good if you want to produce some if you want to create materials like I don't know plastic or uh, colored plastic or metals and so on okay uh, so this is this is uh, its natural application if you want to build a, a new material starting from this one, you will have to add uh, several other properties, which makes it uh, a little better than starting with a generic or a, um, sorry, or a um, generic material, yeah. So uh, it's just that it has uh, some metalness, as you can see, uh, already integrated inside the shader, but um, that's it, okay? So in order to, to start with this, I would say, okay, let's start creating a generic material. Now, generic material, as you can see, it, it is not shiny as the previous one. Um, it is uh, basically gray. It has no reflection, no refraction, and nothing, actually, okay? Um, we are going to create glass. So in order to create a, a physically correct material, because this is our, <laughs> our goal, remember that the, the worst thing that you can do in V-Ray is fake things, okay? So stick to, to reality. Stick what, to what happens in real life to, to real materials, okay? And you will um, uh, basically identify the properties that, and the settings that you have to tweak and how to tweak them, okay? So for example, let's start uh, in, in order. Um, diffuse, what is diffuse? Um, diffuse is actually, um, you might know from, from some physics studies, um, diffuse color is the color that is not absorbed by the material. So it is the color that basically bounces out from the surface of the object that has that material. Um, so diffuse color is the color 
that in our uh, light analysis that we did yesterday is the color that bounces uh, when the light rays hit the surface of an object that is gray, the light that bounces from that object will have this color here. Okay, so this is the diffuse color, the meaning of the diffuse color. Now, what's the diffuse color of glass? Actually, the diffuse color of glass is a tricky question because glass has no diffuse color, right? Because glass doesn't, is, is not involved in the diffusion process. Why? Because glass is totally transparent. So light doesn't bounce on glass. Eventually it is reflected, but reflection has nothing to do with diffusion, okay? So diffuse color of glass can also be red. I don't care because it is going to be overridden by transparency, okay? So let's move down. Reflection, is glass reflective? Of course it is. And depending according to uh, how much polished is the surface of glass, it can be highly reflective or, some, or have some blurred reflection effect. But in any case, reflection color this is something that uh, I told you yesterday, like on the fly, but any parameter uh, in a V-Ray can be set up in several different ways. So you, you see here reflection color. Now, reflection color, you might think, uh, okay, this is the tint of uh, the re light reflection. No, this is the amount of reflection, okay? So it calls it reflection color, but it's defining the amount of reflection. So black means no reflection at all. White means full reflection. And there is also this slider. This slider has the same effect. If I move this here, you see that this becomes gray and the object becomes reflective. If I move this to the top, the object becomes very reflective. Um, reflection color can be like also, um, when you see this, uh, this color rectangle here and you click on it, you can also define, for example, reflection color like this. Now, it, uh, it has basically no meaning because actually reflection amount is determined in grayscale. So if you select, for example, a darker color, you are basically defining uh, reflect, reflectivity like with this uh, gray tone or with something that has more or less this dark level. So I wouldn't recommend you use colors here because actually what you are defining is just a, the amount of reflection, which is not in colors, it's in grayscale. So don't use colors here because it is, it is meaningless and it doesn't allow you to perfectly control the amount of reflection that you are creating. And then there is also the, the possibility to use texturing in order to define different, differentiated reflectivity of your material. Like different area of the surface will reflect more or less than other areas. Um, we will eventually do this uh, uh, in a while, but not for glass. Um, then there is reflection glossiness. Now this is automatically set to one, which means that the surface is perfectly polished, okay? Uh, if you want to simulate a surface that is not perfectly um, polished, then you must lower the, this thing. Now, if you start lowering this, the, this value here, you will see that the reflection becomes blurred. Uh, this glossiness here is actually uh, the simulation of uh, uh, some micro roughness of the surface. This has nothing to do with bump. Bump or displacement. Bump or displacement normally are used to simulate, uh, let's say, visible roughness or visible bumps on the surface. Roughness as well as, as glossiness are, are two parameters that define micro, uh, micro uh, uh, roughness, okay? So something that is not visible, but that is present and, uh, and uh, produces this kind of uh, diffusion of the, of, of the reflection in this case, okay? Now, the, the thing is that when you, you, you tweak this reflection glossiness, I wouldn't tweak this value to values that are lower than 0 0.6 more or less. 0 0.6, 0 0.5, yeah, something, something like, like this. Because if you go like this, uh, your object is actually reflective very reflective because the, the reflection color is, is still white, okay? But the diffusion of this reflection is so spread over the surface of, uh, of the object that you don't see reflections anymore. You see only the reflection only on the edges of this object. 
So this is used to create some very, very specific materials like, I don't know, if I go back to black and I give this kind of reflection glossiness, I am creating materials like rubber or something like that, which is still reflective, but reflection is so diffused uh, because of the porosity of, of, of the material. Okay, so this is what happens in, in rubber, for example. But it's, it's a very, uh, let's say, um, specific material. I, I think I've never used rubber in, in, in my renderings. But anyway, this is how you could eventually uh, create rubber. Um, and the more important thing is, so, so don't go below 0 0.6 normally. If you go below 0 0.6, normally it's because you don't want reflection, okay, normally. So um, just uh, pay attention to these uh, little uh, thresholds that I am, that I will be uh, telling you. Um, and, and in a while, I, we, I will make another consideration about reflective material in general, this, besides glass. I need glass because I want to have light entering this room despite the glass presence, okay? Fresnel, we are going to discuss Fresnel in, uh, in a while. It's a very, very, very important uh, parameter. Um, and then there is reflection IOR. Uh, even in this case, we are going to discuss this uh, uh, later on, okay? So, um, this is basically, if I want a polished glass, which is the case of my, all my glasses here, there is no need for um, lower values of, of glossiness in, this, uh, in these cases. So this, that's it for reflection, okay? And the most important thing, refraction. Refraction, remember, that's the property of uh, transparency, okay? So you see that the object is not refractive right now. So light can bounce and doesn't penetrate inside the, the, the object. So if I turn this to white, finally, I have my transparent object. Despite the fact that it is black, it doesn't matter. If I set this to red, you see that the object is still transparent the same because it is fully refractive. So there is no percentage of light that doesn't pass through the surface of the object. And so there is no possibility for diffuse phenomena. Um, Fog color and these things, we are going to, to talk about them later. Um, IOR, this is very important. Uh, don't, um, don't uh, let's say, uh, be fooled by this IOR, IOR. These are two different IOR. This is index of reflection, and this is index of the refraction. So they are two different properties, okay? That's why this is called the reflection IOR, okay? Um, they affect two different properties. And uh, uh, in case of reflection IOR, this sets the relationship between the amount of reflection occurring on the material surface with respect to the diffuse color. Um, so if you see, this is uh, by default, this is uh, turned off. So it means that reflection IOR is by default set up to 1.6. What does this mean? It means that the amount of reflection is 60% more powerful than the amount of diffusion. Why is this important? Because if I go back to a non-transparent object, because this is what makes reflection appear also when there is no direct light hitting the object. So of course, if, uh, if you have the reflection of the light body on the surface, it will be absolutely brighter than the diffuse color. But what happens to the environment reflection? The environment reflection is being um, represented on the surface of the material with a brightness which is 60% higher than the diffuse color. That's why you still see the environment here being reflected over the surface of the object. If you take this value here and activate it, and you decrease this number here, you will see, well, not that much eventually, you will see that the reflection tends to disappear, okay? So that's the meaning. And if you increase it, you have more reflection than diffuse color. Metallic plastic, for example, okay? So let's turn this back to 1.6, uh, uh, which is the uh, normal IOR, and let's deactivate it. Now in this case, oh, let's also go back to a fully transparent material. Now in this case, IOR, is uh, something that it's related to the density of the, of the transparent material. So each material in this case has its own IOR. There are tables that you can find on spreadsheets that you can find on, on the web 
where all these IOR are listed uh, by materials. So you can find IOR for water, for glass, and so on. So 1.6 is typical for glass. Now, actually, depending on the type of glass that you are using, the IOR for glass ranges between, I don't remember exactly, but more or less 1.5 to 1.7. There are several types of, of glasses. Um, if you want to work with water, for example, which is basically uh, equal, ident identical to glass, but it's, it's just the difference is just the material state, which is liquid. Um, water, for example, has 1.33, um, but only uh, at the environment temperature. So ice, for example, has a different IOR and so on. Okay? So we need glass. So glass is 1.6, it's okay. So I don't need to, to tweak this value. If you, for example, want to render some crystal or diamonds, you must increase this uh, IOR. So for example, diamond has 2.54. And also, uh, almost all gemstone has, uh, have this IOR, which is uh, higher, okay? Um, so basically, that's pretty it, because we have uh, no diffuse color, we have fully reflective material with no glossiness, uh, or, well, with absolute glossiness, actually, in this case, um, and a totally refractive material with the right IOR, okay? So this is glass. And I am going to right click on the on this uh, object here. Well, double click on it, first of all, and uh, just name it glass. And right click on it and apply to selection. Now, this, is, this depends on how you uh, organize your workflow. Normally, I don't use layers or don't use layers that much. Or I don't, uh, let's say, um, classify object by material and put them into layers. So my layers never represent a, a material. Um, eventually, we can have a discussion on this, but um, uh, I think this is the, one of the best ways. So I, I wouldn't uh, subdivide object by layer and give a material to a layer. So you see that I can apply this material to layer, but this is not the right work workflow for me. So I prefer to apply to selection. That's why I, I edited the colors so I can easily select all the glass object and apply to selection. Okay, and that's it. Now, if I, uh, let me uh, also save this. I'm going to save it like with a progressive uh, uh, scheme. So we are going to have, uh, uh, this is actually seen materials, it's going to be. And now light should be able to enter the room because I have glass. Let's see what happens. I should also start to see some reflection on these uh, uh, paintings here. Yeah, you see there is a reflection of, of the window of, uh, of my back here. And light can, can filter, can enter the room because there is glass. So we are starting to enrich our mother. Also there is this thing here, you can see this is the reflection of this window on the glass of this picture here. So yeah, here we are. We start having some some nice uh, behavior. So I would say that glass it's uh, it's okay for now. Uh, the only thing that I would do eventually, um, in order to give glass a, a, a twist, let's say so, I would like to tweak this object here. Okay. So um, I want this object to be some kind of smoky glass, right? So I'm going to concentrate on it, and I, I won't change anything. I don't want to add another, um, let's say, name view. I just want to concentrate on this, uh, which is actually glass, and I want to change this material. So eventually, if you want, you can also change its color to another one, so you can recognize it. Normally, blue is the color that I use for metals, so just in case you are interested, but everyone has its own workflow. Um, so I want to concentrate on this. And uh, let's reopen uh, V-Ray. Right. Let's leave it like here. And let's V-Ray interactive this in order to see what we have right now. So we have glass. Um, it's going to be uh, quite difficult to um, see the results of what I'm going to do in this configuration because you see that the background is too dark. So uh, it's difficult to realize if you are if we are working properly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, change uh, the, the scene a little uh, for just for a while. I'm going to take this object 
I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to place it between me, the observer, and the, the light source. So something like this, okay? So in this case, I expect to uh, clearly see the behavior of this material in a render viewport. Let's see. Yeah, and I will study the, the new material in this configuration here. So I can see the effect of, uh, of the tweaking that I'm going to do, okay? So I need a smoky glass, right? So I will take this, which, is, which has already all the properties of standard glass, okay? And I will right click on this and duplicate it. So I am duplicating the material with all its settings. Double click on this, on this and glass smoky. I, I wouldn't, but um, well, this is something, I, I uh, have a uh, obsessive compulsive <laughs> disease. So I prefer not to use, for example, smoky glass because I want all the glasses, um, let's say, close together when they are sorted by uh, name, for example. So that's why I, I say glass smoky. Uh, but anyway, um, how do we make this glass look smoky? So first of all, if I want to see the updates in my uh, scene, I must apply this new material to this selection. Because if I don't do this, this will always be standard glass. Okay, And I will never see the, um, uh, the edits that I'm going to make to this material. What is smoky glass? Now, one common mistake is... Uh, well, if I want smoky glass, I should take the diffuse color, set it to a dark gray, for example, go into reflection and lower the amount of reflection. So I should start to see, <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry, but, sorry, 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 the amount of refraction because I want some light to interact with the diffuse layer, okay? So I don't want all the light to pass through the object. So if I do this, I start to have this kind of behavior. Now, this, is, this might look the right solution, but it is not, okay? Because uh, smoky glass is not smoky on the surface. It's smoky on the thickness inside the material. It's the material that is smoky, not the surface. It's not like a film applied on the surface of the material, okay? So this is good if you want to have some, um, let's say, um, quick representation of your material. If you're not interested in a very sophisticated simulation of materials, then this might do the job because you already have the right aspect in, inside the rendering. So there is no need for further uh, analysis of this uh, thing. But this is not the proper way of doing this. So glass is still perfectly transparent. Smoky glass is still perfectly transparent. What happens is that in the, in the inner structure of the material, you have some, some gray particles or black particles. And the way you simulate this is by adding the fog color property. Now imagine, for example, let me grab a pencil. Imagine, for example, that this is the thickness of our glass, okay? So we want to create smoky glass. And uh, this object is perfectly transparent. So what happens to light when it passes through this object is that light gets in, for example, like with uh, this angle, then there is a uh, uh, refraction with its IOR. So let's say that there is some uh, change in the light direction due to this uh, uh, IOR. So this angle is specific for each material, okay? And so light passes through the glass like this, and then there is another change of uh, media, okay? So glass density, air density, so once again, there is some refraction occurring, right? And so that's why when you have, for example, uh, I don't know if you have double glass windows in your, in your uh, home, but when you do this, when you have this, you might notice that, that then you, when, when you look through this, uh, this object, it becomes more evident that there is a double refraction phenomenon occurring. And then you have two images, uh, well, actually, Two different views of reality if you look through uh, glass okay but anyway don't, don't consider it. this is very uh, detailed uh, consideration but you have this phenomenon here so what is fog color fog color it tells the tells v-ray that inside our object there are particles suspended particles inside the structure of the of the object that have this color here so what happens this particle here when light enters the object and hit this particle, 
diffuses because diffusion is a uh, light phenomenon, okay? And if this is the diffuse color, this is the diffuse color of our particles, then internally, inside the material, this color will start to show up. What's the advantage of working with this technique? Is that um, if you have, for example, like something like this, let me uh, change example. If you have a glass panel that has this aspect, like this. And if you decide, for example, to work with fog color, fog color will be evenly distributed inside your object, okay? So you will have particles that are evenly distributed inside this object here. And light enters the object in any point of this surface here and gets deviated, like we know, and passes through the thickness of the object. But the thickness of the object is one here, and it's another thickness here, which is higher. So the light that has to pass through this thickness here hits many uh, particles, much more particles than in the thin area. And so this fog color will tend to diffuse more light than the, the fog color that's present on this thin areas. And so the amount of light that gets through the object is less in these areas and more in these areas. And so the object, the glass uh, object, becomes less transparent or more smoky when you have more thickness. So this is the right behavior for uh, a um, colored glass in general, okay? Or a color transparent material. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to define a fog color. And normally, normally, it depends on many aspects, but normally, the fog color should be very, very desaturated, okay? Now, this is true when you have objects that have some relevant thickness, but in our case, we have a very thin uh, glass object. And so if you want to see uh, the fog uh, color effect, you have to increase the saturation of these uh, things. Well, actually, not the saturation because we are in grayscale, but, you know, uh, the value, actually, okay? So you see that this is becoming actually smoky in a, in a different way than the smoky uh, effect that we got with the diffuse color because you see it become very black. Now, when you work with fog color, don't rely on the preview that you have in the V-Ray Asset Editor because the V-Ray Asset ed Editor is based on a specific object which is very thick. And so fog color immediately becomes very, very intense. So also if you use a color here, you see that here you have this nice pinkish behavior and here you have already a, a, a red wine behavior, okay? So if you want smoky glass, this is the way you do it. You add a fog color. But you already understand that if you want to create, I don't know, beer material, then you simply change color to some uh, yellowish and then you have this kind of behavior here, right? So you can do any type of, of colored material uh, color transparent material by adding fog color. Another thing that you can do is to still work with the uh, desaturated or, or low value uh, color for, for the fog color and eventually increase the fog multiplier. So this has the same effect and this is better if you work with thin objects. Because um, in, remember that these fog color affect uh, transparent objects and also depend on the, on the thickness of the object. If you have variable thickness and you only work with the fog color, then soon the thick parts will become black and the thin part will remain transparent. But if you work with fog multiplier, then you have more possibilities to tweak the right amount of fog color with relation also to the thickness of the material. So it's a mix of fog color and the fog multiplier, okay? So you see it's very, uh, nice to work with this uh, with this uh, with this type of, uh, of effect and these are exactly what I uh, told you about uh, not faking materials just try to stick to reality you saw the consideration that we did on uh, uh, on glass and and suspended particles inside it that's exactly what happens in in a real material
Okay, so this is glass smoky actually, and uh, I don't need this uh, this uh, object anymore. I can go back to my name view, and I can take this object here and apply the glass smoky to selection. Okay, and that's it. Of course, I'm not going to uh, be uh, I, I won't be able to see this actually because it stands over a dark background, so there will be no difference. But it's just that I know that, uh, that there is smoky glass on this uh, uh, table here. Um, so uh, this is uh, basically how you you deal with the glass objects or transparent objects, and uh, this can also be, for example, acrylic or I don't know whatever type of plastic, of course, transparent plastic. The only difference is the IOR of refraction. Okay. Um, I want next. I want, for example, these uh, legs here to be like casted metal. Okay. Um, so let's create an. And, and you see that glass is a procedural material. We are not using any ex external asset for creating this kind of uh, of materials. Right. They are all. In, uh, created inside the ray asset editor, okay, procedurally. Um, so let's create a new uh, material, uh, always material and uh, generic. Now, if, if you want to work with uh, metallic materials, remember that there is also the PBR, okay? And now, just in order for us, for us to uh, quickly see how this works, okay, once again, I'm going to um, copy this uh, object and place it in a position where I can easily see. Um, uh, well, actually, I think that light comes uh, more or less like here. So I should also be able to see this object material like in this uh, position. Let's see if I'm right. Be very interactive. And yeah, I see there is some reflection going on. So let me move it a little to the right. Exactly. Okay, so here we have it. And uh, I am going to apply this new PBR material to the object. So I will see the, the behavior as I am uh, tweaking the, the settings. Uh, it's still it's still showing the previews one, I think. Let me double check. It's gray, so it's difficult to notice the differences. Yeah, I think it's already uh, updated. No, it, I think it, it was not selected. I think, apply to selection. Yeah, now we have it, okay. Okay, so if you want this to be metallic, it's very easy in, uh, in, in PBR. You take metalness and you increase this. So it becomes metallic effect. Um, if you want some roughness, so not so polished, then you increase this. I do recommend that normally, in this case, 0 0.2 is already quite a good value for, for roughness. It spreads the, the reflections quite a, a bit, but it, still, it still, still gives you the metallic aspect and it's uh, very visible. So you have this kind of, uh, of uh, representation here. Uh, let me select this and zoom to select it so we can rotate around it and eventually uh, take a closer, a closer look to, to this object. Um, eventually like this. Well, yeah, we start to see this uh, metallic behavior for this object. Um, now, I want this to be casted metal. So casted metal is, uh, is, is not like this. This is very smooth. Okay, so casted metal has this kind of, um, let's say, roughness, but visible roughness, not just uh, micro roughness like uh, the one that's simulated by the roughness parameter here. Okay, so um, of course we can uh, add properties to this PBR. You see that in uh, V-Ray Asset Material Editor, um, there you have the general shader properties uh, already listed here, but there are also this button here. You see, you can add attribute or add layer. So this is meant to be used if you want to create complex behaviors based on a specific shader, okay? But once again, the only difference that we are uh, taking into account between a PBR and a generic material is just this metalness, 
But I want you to understand exactly what affects the metalness of a material in a generic material. So my goal is to tell you that if you work with a generic material, you can build whatever type of material based on this shader. And this gives you full control over the, the um, tweaking of each property of your material. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pre-select this object and apply this to the selection. So we are back to a matter gray. Uh, I'm going to take this also and uh, delete it with simply cancel. And uh, okay, I want this to be metallic. And I want this to be gray, but not this light gray. I want it to be darker. Like for example, this, casted metal, remember. So diffuse is okay. Is it reflective? Yes, of course it is reflective. So once again, let's move this up. Okay, so is this metal? No, this is plastic, okay? How do I change from plastic to metal, to, from shiny plastic to shiny metal? Um, I told you before when we were discussing the glass reflection that the amount of reflection compared to the amount of diffusion is set up by the reflection IOR. So if I activate this and I want this object to look metallic, I must increase this value because I want more light to be reflected than light that reacts with the object diffuse color. So I'm going to take this value and in order to have metals, this number must be from seven up. Normally, 20 is the value that I give a material in order for it to start looking very metallic. So chrome, for example, is a common generic material with a gray or grayscale uh, diffuse color and a very high reflection IOR. Okay, or another thing that you can do if you don't want to work with these, you can simply turn off the Fresnel reflection mechanism. Now, Fresnel is something that you don't want to turn off, never unless you want perfectly chrome material or mirrored material, okay? Fresnel is an effect that uh, changes the amount of reflectivity of a material according to the observer. Now, this is something that um, uh, you uh, might have experienced and, and noticed in, in real life many, many times. So, for example, um, I don't know if you have a... Uh, some wooden object, object in, around you, but if you take a look at a wood, of, uh, a wood material, normally you wouldn't say that, is, that it is a reflective material, right? Um, nevertheless, uh, or if you have a concrete floor, for example, or something like this, like that, you wouldn't say that, that it is exactly reflective. Um, if you have, for example, a floor and you stand and you watch the floor like perpendicularly, it's very difficult that you see yourself reflected on this surface. Because concrete or normally a floor, unless it is polished, is not reflective. But if you have a window here and you look at the floor like in this direction, you might observe that you see a diffused reflection of the window starts to appear in this area. Right? So this material here is at the same time non-reflective and reflective. The thing that changes between these two areas is not the material, is the inclination of the observer view. So in this case, for example, the direction is more perpendicular to the surface of the object, while in this case, the um, inclination tends to zero. Right? So the farther you look, the more you, you have reflection, okay? Uh, so this is what happened with Fresnel. Fresnel exactly is a, a uh, mathematic algorithm that changes reflection according to the inclination between the um, view, the point of view, which means the camera actually, and the orientation of the surface of our material, okay? So you don't want to turn this off. Eventually, if you want to make a chrome material, you just increase the um, uh, IOR, reflection IOR, okay? Um, and I told you from seven up, you start to have metallic behavior, as you can see. Uh, if you go below this value, it's, well, 
you can see it both like uh, metallic plastic or let, let's say a, a something that tends to be metal, okay? Metals are very shiny, okay? So I wouldn't say that, I would say that 10, for example, start to be quite a good value. And it's difficult to see this with a gray color, but if you switch to another color, you will see that now it is more metallic than plastic, okay? So we want casted metal. So dark gray and a high uh, reflection IOR. And we miss something because casted metal is not smooth like this, okay? It's not polished. And we missed bumpness, actually. So we can go here in the bump um, uh, um, tab, actually, and we can set up a bump for this material. Now, you can see that mode can be set to bump, bump texture channel, and normal map. It depends on what you want to use as the bump texture, okay? Um, we are going to discuss uh, materials that tends to represent real life objects and they are based on simple texture but um, for example uh, a very effective way of reproducing uh, roughness uh, visible roughness or bumpness is using normal maps now the fact is that normal maps are not so easy to be found uh, with uh, when you when you when it comes to very specific materials so let's stick to bump maps okay um, which are basically um, Grayscale textures, okay, uh, where black means that the surface will uh, still lie at the original height, and white means, or grayscale gray means that the surface height will increase according to the brightness of, of the pixel, okay. Now, um, if you are working with textured material, you should, need, you should need an external asset in this case. So you should go to bitmap and load an external bitmap but we need some procedural um, uh, roughness. So you see that there are many, many, many textures that you can use. Uh, now texture uh, in terms of, of rendering has a more uh, general um, meaning. Uh, normally texture is, um, is meant, uh, or in, uh, in the, the common, the, the standard user thinks about texture like images, okay? But in our case, Texture is anything that produces a different distribution of uh, color or brightness inside the pixel of a, an image. Okay, so this is texturing. And for example, we can use some noise in this case, or we could use flat, for example. Or each of these, uh, of these uh, texture here produces a different pattern inside the, the image, okay? So let's see, for example, one very simple like noise. Noise generates this type of uh, of a texture, of distribution of uh, uh, black and white with some gradient between black areas and white areas. So you see this grayscale pattern with uh, a noisy behavior. Well, noise means that it's a, a non-repeating pattern, okay? So um, if uh, uh, I um, use this, I would tell the surface that the black areas or the darker areas will stay low on the surface and the white areas will uh, rise up with respect to the actual level of the surface. And you see that it's almost uh, invisible as effect in this moment. Um, this is because of two aspects. First of all, the bump is not a physical behavior. It's just a light behavior. So what does this mean? It means that uh, um, during rendering, you will have the um, feeling that this surface has some uh, variation in uh, height, um, but actually the surface is still perfectly smooth. So it's just light being reflected as if the surface was, um, let's say, non-smooth. But the surface is still smooth. So if you go here and see the edges of this object, they are never going to change with bump texture. Um, so let's let's see what happens if I use this uh, uh, bump texture as it is right now, and I go back to uh, the uh, material. This is the effect that we get, but the edges of the sphere will still look perfectly smooth and spherical. Okay, and I can also take the amount of bump here and increase it. Um, you will see that you have this effect, but the edges are not changing; they look still perfectly smooth. Okay. 
And we see nothing here, or well, we tend to see nothing here because of the scale or the size of the texture. So the size of the texture must be adapted to the uh, size of the object that we are texturing in this case. And that's why I don't uh, apply materials by layers, because you might have, for example, um, marble applied to different objects. And then you need, a, for example, a different size for marble texture according to the objects. If you apply material by layer, you will define texture size by layer. So if all the objects, all the marble objects are in one layer, but they have different sizes, there is no way to procedurally adapt the texture to the different sizes of, of the objects. So that's why I don't, I don't use um, applying material, I don't apply material by layer, okay? So let's go back here inside this uh, texture, and I want this noise to have more frequency. More frequency means that the waves become shorter, and then the noise becomes smaller, well, at, at a smaller scale. And then eventually you might start noticing some effect. Amplitude sets the separation or the, the height between black and white. So it's like, uh, let's say, increasing or decreasing the contrast of our text. So if you want some kind of casted metal in this case, I would increase the amplitude in order to, to have more separation between the black and white areas, and in order to create this kind of porosity over the surface of, uh, of our material, okay? So let's see if we uh, manage to see something in this view here. Uh, I think we should uh, rely more on the uh, final render in this case, uh, because I see no uh, particular um, change in this uh, in this object. Let's see if we can uh, uh, start to see something. But no, I don't see any any change right now. Let's see this uh, with a production render, and let's see if this is something that uh, becomes uh, visible. I'm going to look at a very specific area and execute this uh, render here. Um, remember that, for example, as, um, as the um, uh, render speed or render amount of calculation depends on the uh, amount of light that's uh, being calculated in a specific area of the bucket, when you go closer to object, um, it's, this, this is uh, uh, something that it might sound like uh, counterintuitive, but if you get closer to object and you are starting to work with material, normally the rendering becomes slower just because you are working with material. Um, especially if you use some uh, uh, very specific um, material properties. Now we are working with bump, okay? And not with displacement. If you work with displacement and you go close to an object which has displacement, then rendering might last forever, okay? And we will discuss this eventually in a while. But I still don't see any particular um, um, noisy behavior right now. I, we should, it's impossible to see it from the edges. We should see this uh, eventually on the surface of uh, our object. Let's see if we notice something. I don't see absolutely anything right now. I, I don't know. I should take a look at, uh, at this from just this uh, region eventually. So let's stop this rendering. It's, uh, it's uh, not getting the desired result right now. So let's see if uh, it's something that uh, has to deal. Because sometimes, for example, when I, I notice that when I start to render, render, re-render, and so on, like V-Ray uh, tends to, I don't know, it gets drunk sometimes and stops uh, showing up, uh, let's say, um, uh, starts, stops updating the, the scene. Um, let me see if there is something that I am missing here, but I don't think so. So amount two, it should be already enough. Normally the bump amount uh, normally ranges between uh, zero and one. So two in my mind is already a, an extreme, um, um, let's say amount of bumpness, but, Nevertheless, let's try and see if uh, this changes something. You see that there is no change, so I think that something weird is uh, is happening in my um, in my view ray at the moment. So eventually, I will have to um, um, 
uh, let's say to reset everything. Um, but yeah, no, text replacement is 2D UV. Well, actually we can also switch to 3D and eventually we have, yeah, okay. So we start seeing something. Uh, this is not the exactly necessary, but um, looking for a way to uh, force the noise to be applied to this object. Uh, yeah, with the 3D object space, you see that it starts to uh, work. It should also work with 3D word space. It depends on what um, size you want to take into account for um, this object. Normally, uh, this is not uh, uh, normal. I mean, um, the um, uh, the texture that we are using for bump should also work with 2D because it is applied over the surface of the material, and the surface of a, of an object is always two dimensional. The object might might be three D, but the surface is always a two dimensional domain. So that's why normally you don't tweak this. Um, but anyway, I am forcing now um, the noise to be applied on this object by considering like if it is applied in three dimension. This is not correct because I am losing uh, now. I am losing the control over the size of my uh, noise. Okay, because I am. Uh, um, telling the software that this noise is actually a 3D object. And you see that also, even with this high frequency, that means that the noise is, uh, has a very uh, fine texture. You see that the effect is very wide, okay? So in case you work with this, you should also increase the frequency to a very high value. And you see that you start having this kind of uh, extremely, uh, let's say, small uh, waves, but they are still too big. Okay, so you see that also when you have these sliders here, it's not that you are stuck uh, inside this uh, a, a defined range. You can also change the range by uh, adjusting the uh, value here, the numeric value. Okay, and uh, also in this case, I, I would go back eventually and uh, set this to a smaller value in order to reduce the amount of uh, bumpness that I'm getting. But this is not correct, remember. So I, I am forced to work with very small values because I'm... Uh, uh, basically telling this uh, noise that it is a three-dimensional texture, while it is not, okay? Um, and so you start to see what's the effect of this thing, but this is not exactly uh, going to, to result in a, uh, good, in a good application. Um, the, the advantage of working with a bump is that it's only a light effect. So you are not increasing the object resolution, for example. You are not um, uh, adjusting geometry. Uh, you are just, let me go back to the V-Ray frame buffer and get rid of this uh, uh, region rendering. Uh, you are just, um, let's say, uh, telling V-Ray that when light hits this object, it must behave like if this, if this object was uh, not perfectly smooth, okay? But actually the object is perfectly smooth. And this is good, for example, because this doesn't change um, the um, complexity, geometrical complexity of the scene. And so the rendering doesn't have to calculate uh, many mesh polygons, okay? Because we are not changing the resolution of our, of our object, okay? But anyway, um, this could be a, a preliminary result for our object. And uh, remember that, uh, this is not correct approach, okay? Um, it might be because in this moment I am using just a, a standard geometry. I'm not considering uh, UV mapping uh, and so on. So um, my idea is that if I switch back to 2D UV channel and uh, I tell D-Ray to take this object, go into object properties, take texture mapping and map this surface with whatever type of generic mapping, like for example, I don't know, something like a, what could work right now? It's a, I don't know, spherical mapping, for example, something where I start my sphere like here and map this object with a spherical mapping. Let's see if uh, this, uh, and yeah, we are back to our, um, say, correct, 2D UV channel and a mapping applied to this object. Now, I wanted to discuss mapping uh, later, um, but uh, it, has, it's become, it has become necessary also with this type of procedural um, uh, texture. Uh, so let's discuss mapping. Um, 
um, many people, for example, also um, uh, have uh, a non correct um, understanding of uh, texture mapping. They tend, for example, to use these two uh, names like if they mean the same thing, but it's not like that. Um, so, T, for example, in, in these terms, um, texturing or textures are the let's call them the images that you want to apply over a material okay mapping is the way the rule you want to use to apply a texture over a material or over an object which has that material okay so think about texture as the quality and the mapping as the rule by which you apply that quality to an object so Remember that we are saying basically that our object is uh, non-smooth, so it has some roughness, and we define the amount of roughness and the aspect of roughness by tweaking the, the parameter of the texture. So the texture is this one, okay? How do we apply this texture over the surface of the material is defined by mapping. Now, mapping tells the array that this noise must be applied over the surface, like we did right now, with a spherical mapping. What, what does it mean? It means that the texture, the noise texture, is actually covering not the surface of the material, but the surface of a sphere, the sphere that I just uh, designed around this object. And if you think about the noise applied to, to, that, to that sphere, the noise is then projected on the surface of the material according to that uh, initial sphere. And so the noise is being oriented over the surface as if it was projected onto, onto the sphere and then shrink and uh, projected onto the object again. Right? So this is the mapping that we are doing. Why did I choose spherical mapping? Um, let me... Oh, yeah, don't worry, Sora. Um, why did I choose spherical mapping? Um, the the decision in this case is based on the shape of the object. So if you have, for example, a, like when we will apply materials to these uh, drawers here, they will be boxes, okay? So um, a box has six uh, main orientation in space, and there is no need to apply a spherical mapping to that type of, of geometry. Uh, we just have to apply, for example, a box mapping. But in our case, this object is a totally organic shape. So the orientation of the texture must adapt to a very, very, an extremely variable orientation of the object. And that's why the spherical uh, mapping is probably the best option in this case. Okay, so that's, that's the way you decide, for example, select the object, go into the texture mapping and decide between the default mapping uh, rules that you have. There is also a, a customized um, uh, texture mapping that you can create. But eventually, we will discuss this tomorrow. And this is part of, of, uh, of uh, the reason why I, I think that textured materials are more complex than procedural materials. Okay? So um, we have uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, material here, which has become, uh, let's say, not so smooth anymore. Uh, the frequency is now very, very high. Uh, and it's probably too high because remember that I was uh, uh, simulating the mapping, uh, the texture and the mapping via um, changing the type of texture placement to a 3D object, okay? Uh, but as I switch back to 2D, 500 is now too much. So you see how uh, small are the, the stains, the black stains inside this, uh, this texture. So let's go back to a, some uh, smaller value which is already quite a high resolution for, for a noise, because if you decrease the size of the noise too much, the result will be, uh, once again, a smooth aspect for the object, because roughness is, uh, is becoming very, very uh, small. And so in this case, we start to see, again, uh, some roughness over the surface of, uh, of this material, of this object, okay? And it starts to look more like uh, some casted metal. And if you want to have some kind of uh, darker aspect, then there is always the diffuse color here that you can uh, uh, turn it to a darker color. And if you don't get 
um, the diffuse color to be um, much visible in your in your material, it is because of the reflection IOR. So reflection IOR, if we decrease it, the, the object will become darker and darker because we are uh, getting back some diffuse uh, phenomenon over the surface of, uh, of this material. And therefore we have our a nice casted metal, okay? And once we have it, I can get rid of this and go back to my standard view here and apply this object, this uh, material to selection. So we are starting to build um, this material starting from the procedural ones. Uh, another thing that I would like to be casted metal is this thing here. This is a model from uh, a previous uh, grasshopper uh, course with uh, the topological optimization that uh, I gave well, several uh, years ago, actually. Uh, so it's a simulation of a beam, of the structure of a beam optimized, but uh, it's going to be like casted metal as well. So apply to selection, and uh, this is going to be metal. Uh, cast so I can easily recognize it and uh, let's save this scene once again and let's see how a V-Ray interactive rendering looks now there should be some uh, light hitting this object as well well no just down to the base but there should be some reflection actually occurring on this uh, on this thing so uh, if we create a, a production rendering, this object is now reflective. So it starts to reflect the environment. Okay. Um, so let's go to our um, room, for, for example. I want to create another procedural material and I want to, uh, well, no, let's start with the floor. Yeah, let's start with the floor. Um, so in order to give a material to this floor, uh, I need to explode this, uh, this object because you see that it is just one single box with floor, walls, ceiling, and so on. So I need to explode this in order to have access to this surface. This is going to be my, uh, my floor, okay? And uh, I want to create a floor which will look very awful, okay? But we need to examine um, procedural materials, so uh, please be patient. Uh, so uh, I'm going to create a. I'm going to create another um, genetic material, and I'm going to name this um, uh, floor. And let's start seeing what what happens with procedural material. What's the the the, the only complexity of the procedural material? So let's say that I want some floor with. Uh, I don't know ceramic tiles, for example. Um, so let's start. Let's start with a simple um, procedural texture material. So ceramic tiles um, with two colors: um, one bright color and one dark color. Okay, like in a chess game. So. What I need to do is, first of all, I need uh, to have two different colors distributed like in a chess scheme on the surface of this uh, object, right? So diffuse color is not going to be one single color because there is no way that I can give two different colors to uh, a material by tweaking the diffuse color like this, okay? So I must texture this material. And I'm going to open the texture. And uh, there are several things that I can do, actually. Uh, one thing is to use the uh, simplest um, um, texture possible, which is the checker. So checker actually creates this type of, uh, of texture, um, which, which has basically only two colors, black and white. So if I go back to the material right now, I have this behavior. So let's apply this uh, uh, material to, to the selection, okay? Um, and let's see what happens to our rendering. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to, to see this with this uh, um, light setup. So in order to study the material right now, what I'm going to do is uh, to 
place a B-ray rectangular light here inside our room here at the center. Okay, so let's see if this gives us more visibility for our objects. Is it sure? Okay, so we see only this black area right now. Um, so what we need to do right now is to take this uh, material and tell V-Ray how to apply this material over the, the surface. Now, the easiest way that we can do when we have this kind of, uh, of object here, uh, this uh, surface, is to go once again into the texture mapping properties and apply surface mapping. Why? Because this is a standard rectangular flat surface. So this uh, surface mapping is more than enough to have this kind of uh, material applied over the surface. Um, another thing that, uh, that uh, I normally do when uh, studying materials or preparing materials is that I do something like this. I don't know if these uh, tips um, uh, are useful, but uh, I, for example, let's hide the uh, B-Ray Infinite Plane, let's hide all but this surface. So I want only this surface plus the V-ray dome uh, visible in my scene, okay? And I'm going to concentrate on this uh, surface for a while. So I'm going to V-ray interactive this. And we start seeing this, uh, this thing here. Um, so let's go back to our floor. And let's go back to our... Um, texture mapping, and we applied surface mapping to, to this, and uh, um, you see that um, um, you can also reset your mapping like deleting the mapping for, a, for this object. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, take a specific mapping and apply it to this, uh, to this object. Um, there is also another thing that you can do if you don't want to rely on V-Ray Interactive in this case, which might uh, be too heavy. There are also some other um, properties that you can, uh, um, some other visualization style that you can use, but they rely on cycles. Okay, so in case you want to switch to render, for example, or ray trace, you will be using using cycles to to do this rendering. And uh, both the, in both cases, um, they are this is not capable of recognizing V-Ray materials. Okay, so you are stuck to be ray interactive once you start working with it. Um, so if I go here in the texture, here I have control over the, the texture, and here I have control over the mapping of the texture onto this object. So let's say that I want to, see if I apply surface mapping, you see that I get this kind of weird distribution of, uh, of my uh, texture inside this object. If I apply canal mapping instead, Rhino asks for, okay, so where do you want the first corner of this plane uh, to be placed? And then I can place exactly the, um, um, the, the uh, planner mapping with the extension that I want. Now, let's analyze this in two different, from two different approaches, okay? I can extend the planner mapping to the whole surface. And, uh, and Rhino asks, okay, what are you looking at in this case? I want to look at the UV. A UV and W is the three-dimensional orientation of uh, an object in, in, uh, with respect to its own surface. So in this case, it's a planner uh, mapping. So UV is the, the option. So let's confirm this with Enter. And now you see that my texture is extending, um, it's stretching to cover the whole surface of, uh, of this floor. Pros and cons of this approach. Um, pros is I automatically set my texture, meaning what I see here in beam ray, will be stretched to cover the whole floor. Cons, how many repetitions do I, do I have to set up in this texture in order to obtain square tiles on this, on this uh, surface. It's evident that this is impossible. And also, if, um, if we stretch the texture over the surface, um, it's impossible to understand what, what's the size of uh, these um, squares in our texture in order to obtain squares inside this uh, preview. And also, in, in order to, it's impossible to define the size of the squares, okay? 
But anyway, if you want to work like this, if we want to stretch the texture onto the surface by applying a planar mapping that covers the whole surface, then you go into the texture placement, which means how do you want me to place this texture inside your mapping? And you see that the amount of repetitions is set to one by one, okay? If I increase this to two by two, you see that my original texture, which is the checker, four squares, is now applied twice horizontally and vertically. If I want to be more square in this uh, preview, I need to increase the horizontal repetition, but not the vertical repetition, okay? So you see that we start getting some square aspect, but we are not sure that these are squares, okay? So you see that you need to differentiate the repeat U and repeat V parameters in this case. So if you want smaller squares, for example, this should look like something like five or eventually 10 by eight. And you see that they still look like rectangles. So 10 by seven, we start to have some more square-ish behavior, okay? But it's impossible to determine if they are square or not. So what's the correct approach? Let's get rid of this actual mapping. And let's use a different one. So a different approach would be, okay, I have one by one repetition. So I know that I only have four squares right now. And I want these tiles to measure something like, I don't know, 25 centimeters each. So we are talking about 50 by 50 centimeters right now, okay? So if I want to apply this in a 50 by 50 centimeters, I can do it by using the applied planar mapping because I can simply start from here and tell Rhino I want the other corner to be at R, 0.5, comma, 0.5. So these are actually 50 by 50 centimeters. And I confirm the UV, and now I have exactly tiles that measure 25 by 25. They are perfectly square, which means that if this rectangle uh, is not um, basically um, prepared or has the same dimensions to uh, contain a finite number of tiles, then the last tiles will be cut uh, according to the actual size of the, of the floor, okay? But in this way, we know that these tiles are, are square and they have exactly the correct dimension, okay? So let's go back to our um, name view. And let's also unhide everything. So now we have these uh, tiles here correctly uh, with correct size and, and position. Uh, next thing that I want to do with this floor is eventually, well, uh, let's try and, uh, and do something uh, like uh, that, okay? So we have uh, the uh, texture placement is actually correct. So we don't need to tweak it anymore. And we are basically relying on the uh, standard parameters. So this is good because we are going to create a procedural material with several uh, textures applied, okay? So what I want to do, I want to change the uh, aspect of these tiles. And uh, for example, I want to change the color. And the color is going to be not black and white, but it's going to be black and gray, okay? So I am... Uh, making this, uh, the dark tiles a little brighter. And, uh, and what I want to do, I want to go back to the material and I want to change the, uh, well, of course these tiles will be reflective, okay? So I need some reflection. And if I go into reflection and simply tell that I want this material to be reflective, like increasing this slider here, the whole material has become reflective. So I don't see any change in reflection when I um, move from one tile to the next one, which means that gray tiles and white tiles have the same amount of, of uh, reflection, actually. But I can do several things. Uh, I can either um, tweak the reflection of this material like if it was uh, exactly the same, despite the fact that I'm working with two different uh, tile color, or I can differentiate the reflection by tile type. So I want gray tiles, for example, to be less reflective than the white tiles, okay? Remember, in this case, that in our diffuse texture, 
the white tiles is in the is the first tile, the lower left corner. Okay, so this is the only thing that you must remember. So if we go into reflection and we don't want the same amount of reflection for all the material and we want um, darker tiles to be less reflective, then we must apply the same texture to reflection color. And let's apply the same checker texture. White is in the same spot as the white tiles. So I want white tiles to be more reflective, which is good. So I already have white with correspondence to white. Remember that white in terms of, ref of reflection means 100% reflection, okay? Black, on the other hand, means 0% reflection. So you see that now in our rendering, you might notice that gray tiles are not reflective at all. So I must take this and give some reflection to, to the gray tiles by increasing these to some gray value. And I am already obtaining that gray tiles are less reflecting than, than white tiles. Um, I don't have to take into account the texture placement because in the diffuse texture, I didn't tweak any of the parameters here. I am working with standard UV repetition one by one. Okay? And as you can see, we are working with 2D UV channel. So this is perfectly right. I am already obtaining uh, gray tiles Less reflecting, than, less reflective than than white tiles. Okay, and we start having this uh, uh, nice behavior for for the floor. Um, this is very good if you are working in an, a scene where you don't have the perception of the separation between these tiles, the grots between these tiles. Okay, so this kind of approach is good for if you want to work with. Uh, a floor that you see from the distance okay but if you have the, the if you start seeing the details if you ha are in a close-up that involves also the floor then this texture uh, this material is no longer um, let's say good for for that type of uh, render um, another thing that you can do with procedural material this is a very simple one right because we are just uh, using two textures and you see that the only thing that you must do is synchronize the parameters of the two textures uh, in order for them to work properly in the same direction, right? So I want to change, for example, the color of these uh, tiles here. And I want it to be uh, like a random distribution of, uh, of colors. Now, in, this has two solutions, one that approximates the result and the other one that is the proper um, solution. So let's start by tweaking this one, which is not the proper solution, okay? So I'm going to go, I don't want to change the uh, amount of reflection, okay? I just want to change the um, color of these tiles. So I go into this uh, diffuse, and I have the colors, which are black, uh, white and gray, but I also can texture the color A and texture the color B. So let's say that I want color A to be non uh, not white like this, like uniform white, but I want some like um, random behavior in between white and light gray, okay? So I can texture this with some, uh, I don't know, noise texture. You see that this is the texture that we are applying. You see that the tile, the white tiles are no longer white. Uh, and uh, if we go back to our material, this is the, the previous level of the texture. Remember that we have a checker, and the color A of the checker is actually textured with a noise. Okay? So we are going deeper and deeper at, at, at several levels of our texture, and finally we have the material, which is this one. So this is what we are doing right now. We are applying a noise over the white tiles of our material, not the gray tiles. And you see that this noise tends to be, is it it, actually too small because it's giving us this kind of splotchy behavior inside this, uh, the white tiles. We can also look at this from a different angle in order to have a better uh, understanding of uh, what's happening, like, uh, like this. So we start to... We should start if there is uh, too much reflection right now. Uh, we just start to see that there are some gray areas inside this, uh, these tiles. Now, if this is too much, I mean, if this uh, 
stains here are too small, then you can go back into the um, texture here, go back into texture of color A, and decrease the frequency. So you have uh, larger uh, stains of uh, gray and white areas inside your, your texture. And this gives you some variation in your material, but not at the scale of the tile, but at the scale of the floor. And so in this case, you will have some tiles with uh, some random distribution of grays and white inside each tile, okay? And you also, from the perspective, you can see that gray tiles are less reflective than white tiles. You can see it like the gray tiles are more uh, visible from the distance because they have less reflection. Um, another thing that you can do also, my, considering uh, also always a procedural um, uh, behavior of this material, is let's say that you don't want um, um, gray tiles to be less reflective than white tiles, but we want white tiles to be polished and gray tiles to have some roughness. So in this case, I don't want to use the texture for reflection color. So I am back to a perfectly even reflection between uh, gray and white tiles. You see that the reflection actually is not interrupted by the um, different tiles. It's a continuous reflection. But I'm going to reflection glossiness and use, once again, the checker. Now, in this case, things are um, different because, uh, well, white tile is actually polished. Um, and so white is correct. You see that it behaves perfectly like it was polished. But gray tiles are now totally black. So it doesn't mean that they are not reflective. It's, it means that the reflection is extremely diffused or blurred. Now, what type, what level of gray do I give to these uh, gray tiles in terms of roughness? Remember that a proper value for roughness is around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like that. So imagine that this is actually zero and this is one, okay? So 0 0.2 is something, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 is something that lies here. So when you tweak these parameters here, uh, where you don't have numbers, but you only have colors and slider, then the problem is how much color do I give to this uh, uh, parameter here, okay? And so uh, a, a good approach is to click on this and use the range zero to one for the uh, colors, okay? So here, if you work in zero to one, you can tweak the value by giving it the right percentage, which is in our case 0 0.2. So if I go on value, I can set this to exactly 0 0.2. And then I have the desired amount of, uh, of uh, um, uh, reflection glossiness. But it's not like that because it's the opposite. We, in, in our, in our uh, scale, this is 0 0.2. But um, roughness in this case is not exactly roughness. It's less glossy. Okay? So it's, it's the opposite of this. So we should not give 0 0.2, but we should give 0 0.8. So if we do this, you see that we have a bright gray. So the problem with procedural texture where you don't have values is you have to understand what aspect of the material you are tweaking, okay? And so you see that normally in terms of roughness, it should be a value, but in terms of glossiness, it is a different uh, one. So we try to, to um, interpret the colors of your texture according to this range of values that you have here. So remember that perfectly glossy means one, okay? And the total roughness means zero. So if you think in terms of roughness, you need the 0 0.8. If you think in terms of glossiness, you must decrease this value to 0 0.8. And we have this kind of uh, nice uh, blurred reflection over only over the uh, gray tiles. And as this is uh, um, a, uh, let's say, uh, not glossy behavior, and if, if you are reflecting objects over this surface that are very far from the surface, then you have this kind of very extremely blurred reflection. So the only reflection that you can start to notice on this uh, gray tiles is this halo of reflection that belongs to the window that lies here. 
you don't have any defined reflection like like this one that we are getting here of course okay and moreover we have one halo which is the reflection of the window and another halo which is the um, um, reflection of the light of the sunlight projected onto the wall that lies here okay uh, so this little amount of um, roughness or this little amount of, uh, of glossiness that we are giving um, is basically diffusing the reflection too much because the objects are very far from, from our reflective surface. But this is uh, uh, very nice to, to observe. If I, for example, uh, place an object on the floor, like any object, and, and actually I, I don't care, if I place an object on the floor and I move it in the right position, that should be something like um, here eventually. And I also have to move it a little uh, farther than this so I can start having some uh, reflection, some visible reflection. Let's see if uh, we can do this. Mm, there is too few lights in order to see this effect. But uh, what I wanted to, to point out is that if you have a closer object, an object which is closer to the floor, these, uh, um, let's say, tiles that have some roughness uh, will produce a sharper reflection uh, than the objects that are far from the floor. This is something that occurs uh, uh, normally when you have... Uh, um, let's say um, material that produce a, a, a small amount of reflection. Reflection is still very visible uh, in the contact area between the objects and the, and the surfaces and less visible from the distance, okay? So this is very, very uh, normal. Uh, eventually we can uh, decrease the size of this if we want to uh, take a, a better look at this behavior, get it closer to, to the floor, and eventually move it like um, eventually here it should be a start to be like a good spot. Let's see if I can do this like here, maybe. And if not, I think you get the point. So uh, we can also create a different set, a scene set up in order to see this effect, but. Uh, it's very nice to see a uh, reflection of object that touch the ground, for example, in this case, and then uh, raise up, and the reflection start to be blurred and blurred as uh, as the object gets away from the reflective surface. But anyway, um, eventually we can see this uh, in a different situation because it's very dark uh, right now. So, but anyway, this is uh, this is already behaving uh, properly in terms of uh, a reflection. If you want a, a less blurry reflection. You can always go here, take the reflection glossiness texture and increase the amount of uh, the brightness of this gray. This will make your tiles um, reflective with less blurriness, as you can see. Okay. Um, this is, I repeat, this is something that it works well from the distance because there is no, um, you have no perception of, of the details of the floor. Uh, so it's a very, um, um, let's say, uniform floor with two different tiles with more or less the same uh, properties, as you can see, but very nice uh, to see from, from a distance. But there is a limit to this because what we wanted to achieve was a variation for the color also of these tiles. Okay? The maximum thing, the maximum um, that we can get from this technique is that we can apply a random texture uh, over the whole surface and not inside the, the tiles so that uh, our floor has a color variation that never gets, uh, let's say, uh, ne you never get repetitions, okay? Which is uh, something that is um, concerning most, uh, most of all the users of, of uh, rendering engines. So we don't want the same uh, scheme to be repeated uh, over a surface because it becomes very evident and it disturbs. So the other approach is this one. So let's call this floor something like um, floor um, with uh, noise, okay? And what I want to do, I want to create a new floor. Like, let's start from, uh, from scratch. And I want this floor to be based on 
tiles. Now, even this floor is based on tiles, but this is going to be based on tiles texture. Okay. So I'm going to uh, apply this uh, material to our uh, surface. So we are back to a matter gray uh, behavior. And I'm going to go into the fuse color. And this time, I'm not going to choose the uh, checker. Uh, but if you go here, you have tiles. Now, tiles is a very interesting texture. It's a very versatile texture. Uh, you can create uh, almost any type of tiling with this texture, including bricks, tiles, uh, and, and so on. So you see that it shows this kind of, um, uh, of initial uh, setup with four by four tiling. You see horizontal count, vertical count. Um, remember that our floor still, even if we change the, the material applied to this floor, the floor still has the um, original uh, texture mapping, which is a surface or an area that measures 50 by 50 centimeters. So if we apply this, it means that inside 50 centimeters, we have four tiles. So each one measures 12.5 centimeters. Okay. Uh, if we want to go back to 25, then our horizontal count and vertical count must be two by two. Now, I'm not going to do this uh, initially because I want you to observe the behavior of this texture inside this preview. So I'm going to keep this like four by four. But later on, we will decrease this amount of repetition in order to go back to 25 centimeter tiles. Okay. Now, what's the um, interesting thing of these uh, uh, tiles? Well, first of all, you can decide the color. We were working with uh, a, a floor which is basically grayscale, so I don't want this kind of, um, of uh, uh, copper color. I want some kind of, of gray. And I'm going to use a mid gray. Okay. And if I use mid gray, it's because this uh, particular texture has this parameter here, which are called variants. So if I use color variants and I start to increase this, you will notice that some tiles get darker and some tiles get brighter. So if I, uh, uh, let's say, increase this like badly, then you see that some tiles tend to become white and some tiles tend to become uh, uh, black. So uh, this is very nice because you can create uh, some nice variation. This is actually some kind of tiling which is used for eventually bathroom uh, walls. Uh, it's very common to use this kind of, uh, of uh, um, texture. So you set this color tie to some uh, um, bluish uh, thing, and then you get this kind of random variation of tiles. This is never repetitive because you have a random seed. With random seed, you can change the distribution of color, but it's always random. Okay, So there is no, well, on, on a large scale uh, surface, there is no difference between one random seed and the other one. It's just a matter of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, taste eventually. Fade variance tells you how much variance you have between your, your tiles. Okay, so this is something that affects the transition of, of colors, but color variance is the most important parameter here. So if you want, right, let's go back to our gray scale uh, tiles. If you want some variation, you can, you know, or some, uh, let's say more interesting variation. You can you can work with the tiles texture, define an average color, and then change the color variance. And there is also mortar. So if you are uh, working on on a detail uh, scene where the floor is perfectly visible, then this type of of uh, uh, texture might be the right one. So uh, mortar. You have a color for the mortar that can be in this case is bright but you can also set it to a darker color, as you can see, or totally white color. It depends on what type of uh, tiles you are doing or you are creating. But you can also uh, texture this, uh, this uh, the color. You can also decrease, for example, the width of the mortar. So for example, like to have uh, uh, less separation between the tiles. Uh, so for example, let's go to 0202, and you see that it becomes narrower and it starts to be invisible from the distance, but it's still perfectly visible um, from a close-up view. So let's go closer to, to this point, where you still see the separation between the tiles. 
Um, you can also texture this. Normally I do this because uh, if you are in a close-up and you want to see the tights, eventually you also want to give some quality to the mortar and not just a, a filling color. Um, now, we still miss the uh, bump on this material. So mortars are normally, um, let's say, at a lower level, at a lower height than the tiles, but yet they are still visible. So normally what I do, I go into the color mortar and uh, take a noise. There can always be a noise A, for example, but you can switch, for example, to a more, uh, let's say, dramatic noise like purling, which is the superposition of two different noises, as you can see or there are some other options that you can uh, um, uh, adopt. But in this case, it's not so relevant because the only thing that we want is just a, a color variation inside the mortars, okay? And eventually you would increase the frequency in order to have this uh, uh, color variation to give you some uh, plaster aspect, okay? Uh, so this is more than enough normally in order to get some variation between uh, two tiles. Um, just to, to give some quality also to this aspect of, uh, of this uh, texture, okay? Um, so let's, let's consider this right now. I'm not going to, to tweak this uh, anymore because we are already have uh, an idea of how it works. Uh, you can also change the pattern if you want. You see that there are some uh, patterns that uh, allow better representation, I don't know, of uh, uh, running bonds, for example, is for, for um, standard bricks uh, layers. Of course, in case you want to reproduce some kind of a brick configuration here, you must go into the horizontal vertical count and change it because else you have this kind of a square tiles applied on, uh, on your uh, surfaces. So eventually vertical count should be double the amount of uh, uh, horizontal count and you start to have this kind of brick-like uh, 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 covering of, uh, of your surfaces. But anyway, let's go back to our four by four for now and let's go back to our custom tile. Okay. Um, so um, I don't want to um, further uh, tweak this, uh, these parameters because we already have some um, things to remember. So remember that we are working with this uh, uh, gray here that is uh, 0 0.5, so very easy to remember. Four by four is the standard. Uh, color variance, let's give this to, to 2.5. And uh, the gap, horizontal and vertical for the motor is 0 0.2, okay? Well, 0 0.5, 25. So we only have a few values to remember. So uh, mid-gray, 2.5 and 0 0.25, okay? So this is the diffuse color. Now, what I want to do with this uh, material is also go in uh, reflection. And I'm going to initially give the same amount of reflection to all the tiles. Okay, I'm not going to differentiate this. Uh, what I want to do is apply a bump. And the bump map is going to be, once again, a tiles texture, four by four. And this time, what I'm going to do, I want the tiles to, to um, be at a higher level and the mortar to be at a lower level. In order to do this, I don't need variation. Variation is good for the color, but not for the, the height of these tiles. So I just need the color of the tile to be, let's say, something like white, and the color of the mortar to be black. And this is more than enough because this is telling the surface that the mortar are lower than the face of our tiles, okay? And we start to see some shadow here on the edges of our tiles. The amount of uh, uh, the bump gives us the um, amount of uh, um, um, shadow that we get on the edges. But remember that bump is just a light effect. So in, in the V-Ray um, uh, interactive, you don't see it, but you see the effect here, okay? So if I set this to 0 0.3, you will notice that it becomes smoother, the surface is smoother. If I set this to 10, you will notice that the motor becomes more and more visible also from the distance, okay? So yes, we need to, to use the same uh, texture also for the bump map, of course, but uh, we don't need to tweak the colors because uh, colors in terms of uh, bump are in grayscale. 
uh, but grayscale means that white is higher and black is lower, and that's it. If you want, if you apply color variance, for example, like this, you will have uh, some tiles will be lower than some other tiles, and you don't want this unless you want a rough uh, floor in your in your uh, uh, scene. This is normally for exterior floors, like gardens and so on. Okay, where you don't have a even uh, level for all the tiles. So that's another example of uh, procedural um, material, still very simple. Um, so is there any question for, uh, for uh, this, uh, uh, the things that we have uh, already solved today? Do you have anything that you want to comment or ask? Is it possible to do an example of using perhaps brick or, or stone to create yeah, sure, 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 tile sure. pattern? Sure, we will, we will do this. Well, bricks is one thing, stones is another thing. Uh, stones is going to be quite more complex, but bricks, yes, we can do this. We will use the exterior walls that we have in our model. That's why I uh, gave these walls, uh, this uh, outer uh, surface. Okay? We will switch to exterior and, and we will create a brick wall. Uh, but stones is different. Stones, uh, we need to work with uh, external assets. And uh, in that case, things become quite difficult, but we will see, we will take a look. And can we angle the tiles rotate? Yes, of course, because um, uh, the, the angle of these uh, tiles depends on the texture mapping that we applied here. Uh, so if I uh, go here in the top view, okay, and I uh, tell um, Rhino, because this is part of Rhino interface, that I want to show the mapping of this object. Rhino displays this one. This is the, the, the mapping widget, okay? And the mapping widget has its size, which defines the size of the, of the tiles, but also its orientation. So if I want these tiles to be oriented like 45 degrees, I click on the rotation widget here of the gamble and set 45 as the angle. This rotates and the tiles also rotates accordingly. So yes, you, you can, of course. But I want to go back to minus 45, so we have the proper uh, orientation for our tiles. Any other question? Um, um, I have one more question. Um, yeah. I wonder, um, maybe toward to the end of the day, we can talk about the rendering uh, quality in terms of uh, the shadows on the wall. So uh, I think yesterday we were doing a lot of settings um, to create, uh, uh, to kind of deal with the quality of the rendering. But uh, in right now, the, the shelf doesn't really cast any shadows on the wall. So I'm wondering, can we address that sometime today or, or sometime during the workshop? What is not casting shadows on the wall actually? Sorry. Uh, so right now the, the shelves uh, oh. in the room looks like it's floating because there's no uh, shadows uh, underneath of the shelves. Uh, it just has the uh, global illuminations. Uh, so are, are, you, are, so you sure, just, are you sure there is no shadow being cast by the shelves on the wall? Because I see it here. Hmm. You see it? Yes. Um, it, it, depends, it, it depends on the light source orientation, okay? Also, there is one thing that, that I, I, I perfectly understand the question. Also, there is one thing that you can do. Um, the, the, the thing with, uh, with shadow is that um, when you have um, a, a direct illumination, well, shadow becomes, well, quite evident, right? So you have this uh, perfectly evident shadow here from the shell and also from, from the desk projected onto the wall, right? Um, also from the window frame. So everything is, uh, is working properly and you have a clear uh, understanding of what's happening. What, what happens when you don't have direct illumination? Of course, you still have some um, lower amount of light, be, be, well, uh, especially below the shelf, right? But this is not due to uh, the um, direct light uh, um, uh, touching or hitting the object and being projected. This is due to another effect which is light diffusion inside the environment, right? So uh, what happens if, for example, we don't have any light hitting directly in the shelf and the project being projecting a, a shadow on the wall? Like, for example, 
these shelves that are here at a higher level. Now, in this case, it, um, it might happen that exactly what you are saying, right? There is no projected shadow. How can you uh, make this area darker? Well, this happens, first of all, this happens naturally um, in terms of, of light distribution, but there is one parameter in V-Ray that you can tweak in order to um, make this effect more evident. So if you go into uh, V-Ray render settings and you go inside global illumination, uh, there is one thing that is visible only if you set up the um, advanced parameter. So if you visualize all the sliders here, you are into advanced settings, there is ambient occlusion. And ambient occlusion, uh, actually what it does, it, and, and I think it's activated, um, I don't know if, uh, I don't know why, I think I activated uh, yesterday after the, the course. Uh, but anyway, if you activate this, ambient occlusion is an algorithm that uh, despite the light condition that you have in your scene, only uh, makes this consideration. If you have some concavities in your scene, like the angle between the shelf and the wall, it's more likely that light cannot reach these areas the same way that it can reach the open surface of your wall. And then it adds some darkness in that areas. So um, if you want to, uh, we can also uh, do this uh, like this. Let me stop the progressive rendering. Uh, let me go into our um, initial interior uh, locked uh, scene. Uh, so let me turn off interactive because you see that um, interactive is, is actually um, tweaking all the V-Ray settings. You see that also global illumination gets uh, turned off and, and so on. It, it works its own way. Okay. So if I do this, I have ambient occlusion, uh, which is uh, already uh, switched on. Um, I just want to concentrate on, uh, on, uh, on this. Uh, so everything looks, uh, uh, looks good. I have uh, the safe frame correct. Okay, so uh, let's do this. Let's turn off ambient occlusion, okay? And let's render this, uh, this scene with a, let's call it a production render. So see how this production rendering has become brighter because most of, of the materials are actually white. Okay, so that's what I was saying uh, at the beginning of this session. Uh, we, we are no longer overriding the material, so white is dominant in our scene right now and not gray. So everything becomes brighter. But anyway, we will have a particular region where we want to concentrate, which is this one. Okay. Um, eventually, I can also render just this area, so we don't waste time with uh, the whole scene. So let's wait a few seconds. Gradient map doing its job, and final rendering of this uh, image. Okay, so you see that here you have clearly the, the projected shadow, and here you don't have it. There is already a natural uh, effect where you have a darker area below these shelves, but it's not enough normally, and you're right, okay? So that's why ambient occlusion exists. So if I activate this and uh, re-render this scene, ambient occlusion is, is, is visible only on the last pass, as you can see. It's not visible in pre-calculation mode. But you can clearly see that these areas are now darker. Okay, so ambient occlusion is not a light consideration; it's a geometry consideration that V Ray can do. Okay, so you do this, especially in interior, of course, um, especially in interior where you have lots of detail and lots of areas where light cannot reach naturally. Then ambient occlusion allows you to better, um, let's say, render those area with a darker color. I, I think this is what you were referring to, right? Uh, yes, that solved the, uh, the the no shadow issues in mm -hmm. under the shelf. That's perfect. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. And one and one more thing, just because we are talking about ambient occlusion, is that you can define radius and occlusion amount. Now, um, normally, if you work properly, which means you are working with meters and you are working with the right scale of your objects and so on, you shouldn't need to tweak these values here. Okay, because they are already 
uh, in, in the right preset. But if you want, you can extend or expand the ambient occlusion, which means that you can also consider like a problematic area in terms of, uh, of uh, light distribution according to geometry, also around these open corners here. Now, it's evident that these open corner, corners have, have not the same problem as these little areas beyond, be, uh, below this, uh, this shelf, okay? But if you want, you can also, let's say, um, uh, dramatize your, your scene. For example, if you want some uh, dirt effect on the corner of your, of your room, then you can also tweak these values here. For example, occlusion amount. If I increase this, like very much, and then I go and render this. So let's, uh, let's see what happened like, in this case. Unfortunately, remember that, as I told you, ambient occlusion is only calculated in the last step when the final image is being uh, created. So it's not visible in pre-calculation mode. I am just waiting a, a little in order to stop the rendering. So now I can concentrate on the area where I want to concentrate, which is this upper corner here. And so I can render this and wait less time. Repass, repass, repass. And you see that everything is black right now. That's because I ex exaggerated, of course I wanted to, but this is what I'm doing. I'm telling V-Ray that when it has some geometric condition like concavities, then occlusion amount is going to be quite intense. So light, it, it assumes that light cannot reach this spot here. Of course, I exaggerated. Now, let's go back. This was 0 0.8, if I, if I don't remember wrong. But if we go to, uh, let's say, 2 and uh, re-render this uh, area, we should start to see some transition or at least some uh, um, variation of uh, darkness around the corner. Let's see. Not in the corner, but here eventually we should start seeing something. No, it's, it's still too much. Yeah, we start seeing something. You see that, that this area is getting uh, like dark gray, but not black. So once again, if we decrease this and repeat rendering, see how the pre-passes are, are, are perfectly identical, even if we are tweaking the ambient occlusion. It only shows up in the last step. And here we start to see this dirt effect that I, that I was saying, okay? It's like if this room needs some painting soon. But this is good, for example, if, in these areas, but if we go back to our uh, standard uh, scene, and we concentrate on more or less this area here where the shelves are. Uh, this, is, this should be eventually uh, quite much because uh, the, the shelves are very close together. So everything is going to become quite dark in this area. Let's see. Well, not that much. Still, yeah, it, it, it's very dirty around here, but yeah, it's still perfectly visible. So yeah, I would say that, that you can tweak these parameters, but normally I, I, I wouldn't exaggerate because uh, um, the effect is, uh, is that you, in, instead of, of tweaking a, a light effect, um, you see I'm talking about the dirt. Uh, it's because this is the effect that you get. It's like um, affecting the material um, behavior, right? 